Thank you for joining today's educational opportunity, Health Equity and Justice Through Your Path to Value Project. By attending this webinar, participants will understand the relationship between health equity, inequity, and quality, learn to keep a health equity lens when choosing an intended population, and know the tools that will help know the tools that will help your healthcare organization move forward in health equity initiatives. With this being shared, I'd like to welcome our program manager, Rhonda Barkas, to kick off today's webinar. Rhonda? Okay. All right. Thank you, Kiana. We are very happy to be here with you all for the first webinar of this year's Idaho Path to Value program. Um, so, and we're excited about this topic. It's, um, it's such an important one, and I know it's going to impact your population's selection and making sure that we are considering diversity, equity, inclusion, and health equity as we are moving forward on our projects. Next slide, please, Deb. So just as a reminder, this program is um, supported by Idaho Bureau of Rural Health and Primary Care. Next slide. Okay, and Kian has already shared with you that we are Rural Health Innovations and we work specifically with rural hospitals, clinics and communities across the country in almost every state. Next slide. One of the things that really matters to us a lot at the center is uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, anti-racism. And so we work really hard to make sure that we're creating an environment for our staff um, where our, um, our staff reflects the environments that we are serving. And it's also a place where all staff are accepted, empowered to be their authentic self and everybody belongs. The other piece of our um, DEI and anti-racism stance is making sure that we are continu continuously looking at our technical assistance to make sure that the programs we're supporting like Idaho Path to Value is done through um, with that, that health equity lens in mind. Next slide. All right, so Kiana shared a little bit about the agenda for the day. So I'm going to kick it off starting to talk a little bit about the, uh, the some of the definitions to make sure that we're all on the same page when it comes to health equity, inequity, and especially how that relates to quality and impacts health care. Um, then I'm going to turn it over to Kim Norton. She's going to talk about how to use that lens when you're looking at your intended population for your project. And then, um, then she'll pass it on to Deb, who's going to talk about some tools that can help your organization as you are moving forward and using health equity initiatives. All right, Kiana, next slide. All right. Um, so in addition to being the program manager for community and population health, I'm also community manager or the manager for rural health care provider transition project, which we call RIPT for short. Kiana works with me on that project. And this past year, we did a we held a two day summit um, and we pulled together a lot of um, subject matter experts in the fields of value-based care, um, health equity, quality, um, policy. And um, one of the things we did at the beginning is instead of asking our participants to introduce themselves by uh, their job and where they, you know, where they've worked and their, um, their, um, their education, instead we asked them to select an um, a quote or make a quote for themselves that really matter to them and share um, that really tells a little bit about their feelings about health equity. So here you can see Wade Gallen, he's a consultant with Stroudwater Associates and he said, medicine is not health care, food is health care, medicine is sick care. So we need to proactively address the underlying health issues related to the whole population, considering the dif differences that drive inequities. And so that's, I think that statement sets a nice foundation for our talk with you all today. Next slide. So one of the things we do want to say in setting the stage here, and I'm actually going to mention go back to this a little bit later when I talk about um, some of the things that have really impacted um, um, kind of systemic race, racism in our country. Um, but we really want to recognize the trauma, medical abuse, and discrimination that have happened to our Black, Indigenous, people of color, 
people with disabilities, LGBTQIA plus communities that has led to mistrust or distrust in medicine and social service providers. And so the work of equity and anti-racism really requires that we are all actively committing, committed to rebuilding this trust with these communities and bringing those voices to the table. Next one. So here are two health equity definitions that I think we at the center really like because they are very rich and they really, I think, um, capture what's important about the person. Um, so the first one is from CDC and it's that health equity is achieved when every person has the opportunity to attain his or her, her full health potential. And then nobody is disadvantaged because from achieving this potential because of any social position or socially determined circumstances. And then the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, health equity means that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be healthy. This requires removing obstacles to health, such as poverty, discrimination, and the consequences, including powerlessness, lack of access to good jobs with fair pay, quality education, housing, safe environments, and health care. So very clearly, both of these definitions really um, look at the holistic view and the picture of the whole person picture of all the things that will influence health. Next slide. Uh, so here is just a visual of health equity. So it usually refers to, again, the individuals achieving their highest level of health by eliminating disparities that impact health and health care. And so you can see the different components that impact health equity, education, access and quality, health care and quality, neighborhood and built environment, social and, commu and community context, economic stability. So all of these pieces factor into health equity. What's interesting is, um, Keon and I, one of the things that we do as part of the community and population health team is we also do co um, community health needs assessments. And one of the things that we're seeing is more and more organizations are really starting to address these issues. Instead of looking at just their healthcare services, they're really looking at other um, aspects that impact health. Next slide, please. So Kim is going to come back later and talk about social drivers of health. And you can see, again, the pieces that encircle social drivers of health that really matter. But uh, you probably have seen some of this data before. Just a reminder that um, access to health care is only, only actually impacts about 10 to 20 percent of a person's health. 50 percent is impacted by their behaviors, 20 percent by genetics, and then another 20 percent by the environment in which they live. Um, I think it's, um, you know, to go back to social drivers of health for just a moment, um, again, another example from a community health needs assessment that, uh, that Keona and I did is that there, we were working with a rural community that had a lot of obesity in their community. And so a lot of times people were like, well, why don't you just eat healthy foods? Why don't you just buy healthy foods? But for this community, for instance, there was no grocery store located in their community. Walmart was 20 miles away. And so much of the population had no transportation to get to Walmart to buy healthy foods at a good cost. So what they ended up having to do, as we often see in rural, is people were doing their grocery shopper, shopping at Dollar General, which um, has fewer healthy options for food, and we also know is more expensive. So the folks who have less, fewer resources to buy healthy foods as far as with economics we're having to pay more for healthy food. So that's an example of an impact of social drivers of health. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on this because I think it's important for us to understand how health inequities came about and um, how they are so deeply ingrained in our country. Um, so you can see 15% of all Americans live in rural areas, and yet um, there's a greater risk of death for heart disease, cancer, unintentional injury, chronic lower respiratory disease, and stroke than what we see with urban Americans. And then again, to the right, you can see um, some of the 
um, health disparities when it comes to different um, populations like Latino, 63% more likely to be a diabetic. Um, Asian American and Pacific Islander liver cancer, 58% more likely. So, um, so I think it's important though to realize how did we get there? What, what's going on that's creating this? And that's really what we call health inequity, um, structural and systemic racism. Uh, so this can really be described as it's the difference in access to power. The different, um, so the different groups and how much power and access to power they have, how many resources they have available, and then the opportunities by race that are really almost no normalized um, in laws and policies, practices, institutions, and government. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. And so one of the things we often hear is how the color of a person's skin or their zip code um, is often a huge determinant of the quality of their care that they receive and the likelihood of developing a disease or dying from a pre preventable death. Um, at one point when I lived in an urban community, there was a, a very affluent area of town. And I noticed that a lot of the people that lived in that area, they had a bumper sticker on the back of their car and it was simply their zip code. And that's all it was. And that spoke very loudly about their access to resources that others might not have. So we know that we need to be able to have the right data, and that's really hard to do um, to, as we're looking at health disparities. But that's, you know, that's where we have to begin to dig down into um, what are the disparities we're seeing in our population, in the people in our communities, what are we seeing with disease and death from diseases according to population. Um, and this begins to help us to understand where those disparities are happening, because otherwise it's easy to oversee them or think, especially in some communities that tend to be primarily white, it's easy to assume that um, our, our community is not very diverse and so it's not happening here, but there's so much more to, um, to uh, racism and that institutionalized um, inequities um, besides race. So I want to give you guys some examples of real, real um, studies or real um, things that have happened in our, in our country that have really embedded that racism and in inequities into, um, in, into our, um, um, some of our um, systems and our structures. So for instance, um, there, uh, the, there's an example of systemic denial. So back in the 30s and 40s, um, FHA loans were offered by the government to help people to purchase new homes and to upgrade their existing homes. However, what most folks don't realize, and so that sounds really nice, but what most folks don't realize is that um, there were pieces of that that actually prevented African Americans from taking part in those FHA loans to be able to buy homes or to be able to update their homes. And so that's really just uh, directly related to racial disparities in home ownership today. Another thing that happened back during World War II is when the, the veterans came back from the war, um, the government offered the GI loans for college so that they could go to college and and um, have a better future. What is often not known is that the GI loans were only offered to whites, not blacks. They were not, blacks were not allowed to have the GI loans. So again, you can see how th things begin to get really embedded in our culture and it certainly it happened well before World War II. A couple other things, um, American Medical Association, they did a report back in the early 1900s that led to the closure of black medical schools that led to shortages um, of black physicians through 2019. But interesting in just one example of why this matters, a recent study in, of Florida births found that black newborn babies are more likely to survive when they are cared for by black doctors when they're, than when they're cared for by white doctors. A couple other interesting. Um, this was actually, if any of you get the FRHP updates that come out every week, this was actually in the FRHP updates just, I think, three weeks ago. And they were talking about a study how postpartum care differs across health insurance, geography, and race. So they were looking at data 
um, generated by 138,073 patients to learn more about the factors that contributes to um, differences in the care that those patients receive two to six months after childbirth. Specifically, they were looking at two standard components that are recommended by national quality standards, depression screenings and contraceptive counseling. What they found is that the highest receipt of those two components, the folks who got depression screenings and contraceptive counseling, um, uh, that was the highest recipients of this was, were the privately insured white urban individuals. And, um, that, and the findings were that it was, it was significantly lower for the Medicaid insured patients, rural residents, and people of racially minoritized groups. Um, but what was also interesting is for these other three groups, the, uh, the Medicaid insured rural residents of people of raci racially minoritized groups, what they did find is that postpartum, those recipients tended to get more screenings for smoking or abuse, birth space counseling, and more discussion around eating and exercising. And then one last study I just want to mention, um, and that was, many of you are probably familiar with the uh, Tuskegee syphilis study from 1932. This was done by Public Health and the CDC. They were, study, they were studying over 400 African-American men who were untreated for syphilis, and they were studying them without their knowledge to see um, what was the natural progression of syphilis. And um, what's amazing to me is to find out that that study did not actually even end until 1972. So that study continued up until 1972. And so again, another example of, of some of the things that have happened in our country that create that system, that feeling of mistrust in um, doctors and medicine that might also get in the way and be barriers for some groups of people to accessing care. Next slide, please, Deb. So if you would just put in the chat box. So we talk about health inequities. We think of usually race and ethnicity. In the chat box, please put what are other groups in your community that you think also experience health inequities? So what are some other, and um, Kim, if you don't mind, if you're able to see the chat box, could you read out if, you, if there are any responses? So what are other groups in your community that also experience health inequities? It may be, be a, a race or ethnicity, but think about your, uh, the other groups that are maybe underserved that don't have the same access to services or care as others do? Yep, and I am, I'm checking the okay. chat. Uh, okay. Nothing okay. yet. We'll give people, oh, 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 mentally disabled popped up from Bingham. Yes, mentally disabled, absolutely. And one of the um, other populations that also comes up in CHNAs are um, those with physical um, those who are living with physical disabilities who sometimes don't have as easy access to different resources based on their disability. Any others? Okay. Not quite. Okay. Well, we'll go ahead and move on, but really begin to, I encourage you guys to think about that because, oh, here. Um, so the other thing is that um, we all have them. And so looking at health equity in our community requires we look at those underserved populations. All right, next slide, please, Deb. All right, and you have probably seen a slide similar to this, and this is showing the difference between equality uh, and that it's not the same thing as equity. So the first one in the, in the upper left corner shows what inequality is. So it's unequal access to opportunities. Um, and even clearly by the picture, there are some folks who have easy access to the opportunities they need, others who have either very no access or 
you know, for the gentleman on the right, it would be very, very hard. He'd have to work very hard to have access to the opportunities. It would take a lot of work. The next slide, the next one over is equality. And again, that is evenly distributing tools and assistance. So you can see there's a st uh, step, a st some steps. So the person on the left, they have very easy access to to resources now, but still the one on the right, um, while he's a little closer, he still does not have good access to, to the resources and tools and assistance. Equity is getting a little bit better, and that's where we're creating custom tools that will assist everybody depending on what they need. So, and it addresses the inequality. So again, the guy on the left, he can easily grab the fruit and the resources he needs. The one on the right also, is able to access his resources. And then lastly is actual justice. And justice means we are fixing the system so that um, we're offering equal access to both tools and opportunities. So instead of it just being about um, the resources of the fruit in the tree or, or building the, the steps, it's really about fixing the tree so that everybody has access to what's in the tree instead of having to have tools to be able to even get any sense of equity. So as so we're really thinking about moving towards, you know, as we're thinking about health equity in our community, we need to keep that in mind. And how do we best serve um, different communities? You know, I think also, also you all, you know, you work in healthcare, and so you see this every day, every day, you know that not every patient needs the exact same treatment plan. And so if we try to do the exact same treatment plan for every everybody, some might be getting resources they don't need, while others are not getting the resources they do need. So it's not helpful for us to provide some uh, something to someone if that's not even what they need. And so you guys know that in the hospital and an, an exceptional tech nurse, whomever, they're able to see the person and they're able to see the individual needs of the person and then um, be able to flex um, their work with that person to meet their needs. So for instance, uh, uh, you know, is, is their patient a extrovert or introvert? Well, a really good um, provider is going to be able to figure out, okay, if they're an extrovert, I need to do a lot of interacting with them. If they're an introvert, maybe not so quite so much. It's a little bit of a quiet, quieter um, environment that they need. Um, does that person need a lot of information? Do they want to know every detail about the test and their diagnosis? Or is, are they like, no, I don't want that much. And again, we need to be able to fit our treatment of people to what they, they want. Do they like to joke around? Do they wanna be serious? Um, and I know most of us probably in our organizations, we do have values around treating people with respect. Um, and again, remind, remembering with health equity, um, while we treat everybody with respect, we also have to figure out, does that mean we treat everybody the same? When I was a child, and I remember in kindergarten, we did we talked about the golden rule, do unto others as you would have do unto the, uh, you would have them do unto you. The implication there is, I'm going to treat everybody like I want to be treated. But that's not that's assuming everybody's like me and everybody wants what I want. And so I've worked with folks who we talked about the platinum rule. Platinum rule is treat, er, treat others as they would have you treat them. And that's what health equity is about. That's what equity is about. It's about knowing what the person's needs are and then being able to respond to that. Um, Deb, the next slide, please. I just have a couple more. Um, so again, the reminder, quality health care is equitable. So this means that everybody has the opportunity to the resources they need in order to have good health. And then the last slide, Deb, for me, um, also from our summit, Amy Elizondo, who is from the National Rural Health Association, choosing to call rural America home should not serve as an earlier death sentence or a lost right for receiving quality and affordable access to care, regardless of race, gender, or religious affiliation. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Kim. Thank you, Rhonda. So each of your hospital teams is in the process of identifying an intended population to focus your project on. Um, and there are a few questions to consider that will help you define your population and also help you start getting an idea of, of the vision for your project. 
So the first question that you may ask is, what are those social drivers of health that are preventing some groups of people in your community from being healthy? Is there a population group experiencing health inequities that you want to address? Is there a health outcome or data that you're looking at that you want to improve? Next slide. Um, what is the community telling you is a health priority area? So maybe you wanna increase transportation or nutrition security, uh, housing even, um, or you know that your migrant workers are not coming in for care or your LGBTQ plus youth are struggling with mental health and behavioral health issues. Um, is your emergency department seeing a lot of patients coming in with complications from poorly controlled diabetes? Um, maybe breast cancer rates are high in your community. So you wanna increase screening for a certain age group. Maybe your community health needs assessment identified mental health or substance use as a top priority area. Um, and then look at who are you seeing coming into your emergency department? And what does your workforce reveal? Likely your staff is a good sample of the people who live in your community and a good place to look for answers. Um, so you might wanna start with uh, implementing a social drivers of health survey or screening um, for your staff to learn more about what's happening in your community. Next slide. Um, so in healthcare, it can be common for us to forget that the people we're serving are human. We look at them through data and reports and records, but sometimes we can forget that they're our friends and our neighbors, our family, coworkers. Uh, when we label people as frequent flyers in the emergency department, we don't see them as mothers or brothers or veterans. We don't ask ourselves what the person's story is. The data might be telling us that our community has a high obesity rate, and we might think, well, that's easy. Let's build a workout gym or let's create a handout to educate people about healthy nutritional foods. Um, but let's imagine that a woman comes into the emergency room with diabetes-related hypoglycemia and an open sore that's infected. She's treated for her low blood sugar, bandaged up, and sent home, and the doctor might tell her to eat snacks more frequently and change her bandages often um, and see your primary care physician soon. But if we zoomed in on this woman's life, uh, her name is Rita. We might discover that she doesn't have a home to be discharged to. She lives in a tent. Uh, she doesn't have food to eat. She doesn't have transportation to get to the food shelf. She has a lot of trauma from years of spousal abuse. She also has a lot of intergenerational trauma from stemming from her, her great grandmother's experience of being torn from her family and culture and placed in an Indian boarding school. She had a job a few years ago and tried to get housing, but due to discrimination, wasn't able to rent an apartment. She also had a primary care physician at one point, but the doctor wouldn't listen to her and Rita lost trust. So everyone that comes through our hospital doors has a story and we need to start looking at the root causes of why some groups of people have been historically underserved and marginalized and really stepping back to see the bigger picture of how we can begin to remove barriers, create equitable opportunities that meet people where they're at and invite them to the table when planning interventions and programs that center them. So um, persons with lived experience, when lived experience perspectives are included in the planning, design, implementation, and evaluation stages, we're better able to develop innovative approaches that reach that intended population and effectively meet their needs. So when you're considering who might be a good representative with lived experience to invite to the table, you wanna make sure that that person has strong connections to other peers with lived experience and, and check that they're able to effectively get feedback from their peers. So let's say you wanna work on a project to increase food nutrition for the Hispanic, Latino, Latino, Latinx population in your community. You wanna learn what that population experiences as barriers to eating healthy foods. So for example, you might think, we'll hold a class on Thursday afternoons to teach people how to prepare a healthy meal. Then you talk to the person with lived experience and you discover actually a lot of people are migrant workers at the local factory and they can't take time off work. 
that the idea of a healthy meal to you might not align with their cultural foods, that people don't have childcare to take a class or transportation to get to the hospital where you're holding the class. Um, and the, the class you have set up is taught in English, which creates a language barrier. You may hear that the reason it's so hard to eat healthy is because the closest place to buy groceries is a gas station and they don't have produce. Uh, you might learn that there is a lot of mistrust in the healthcare system, which could tell you that before you even consider holding a class to focus on nutrition, really what you need to do is work on building trust with that community. So some key components of a co-design process should involve intentionally involving people with lived experience in designing solutions, postponing any design decisions until after you gather that feedback, synthesizing that feedback from people with lived experience into an insights, developing solutions based on the feedback, and just keep in mind that this is a process. process. It's not a single event. It's not let's do it one time and be done with it. It's continually checking back with that community. Um, achieving health equity requires focused and ongoing efforts to address injustices, overcome economic, social, and other obstacles to health and healthcare, and eliminate preventable health inequities. The following principles emphasize the importance of addressing all people inclusively and respectfully. Intentionally embed health equity into your team culture and project vision. And we'll be leading you through a health equity assessment tool during the strategy planning workshop. Um, and Deb will talk a little bit more about that later. Organizations that reflect the population served are more likely to understand community experiences, connect with community and effectively support community solutions. And effective strategies are grounded in cultural knowledge and wisdom. Um, community issues require community solutions, effective initiatives are co-created with and supported by the community served, and sustainable projects complement related community services and activities. And my last couple slides are just some equitable practices to keep in mind. Language matters. Deb will share a guide in a minute that was designed for physicians and other healthcare professionals. Um, and it provides guidance and promotes just a deeper understanding of equity focused person first language and why it matters. Um, assess the need for interpreters or translation services. Avoid using adjectives such as vulnerable, marginalized, and high risk. Um, and you can learn more about that and kind of some better ways to, to use those words. Uh, in the document that I just mentioned. Avoid dehumanizing language, so using first person first language instead, and calling out language that's offensive or perpetuates stereotypes when you hear them. Consider literacy levels when creating communications or marketing materials. Um, and I know this is, a, we just put out a lot of stuff to think about and it's re really, it's just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to equity and inclusive, inclusive, inclusivity, um, but we, we have to start somewhere and putting just one thing into practice is going to make an impact. So if we can commit to applying some of what we learned here today, or at least beginning to question ourselves when it comes to what we can do to be more equitable and inclusive, uh, we have the potential to achieve health equity for our community. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Deb who will share some tools and resources. Well, a lot of information and um, shall we say building material. Now we need the tools to take and put it all together and utilize it. Um, there are many tools available for you focusing on health equity. There are tools for you to learn more and then there are tools that you can directly use in your programming. And we're gonna spend a few minutes exploring each type of these tools. Now I wanna make a note here that you will be receiving this PowerPoint when you receive the recording. And in the PowerPoint, all of these resources have live links in them. So it'll be very easy for you to navigate to them. The Rural Health Equity Podcast Series. 
This is a four-part podcast series that brings together a variety of voices to elaborate on steps rural hospitals can take when implementing sustainable health equity programs and efforts. So here you're able to hear from your peers across the country. Now, Rhonda mentioned having a health equity steps, um, summit. And the report from this summit is a really good resource for you. As she mentioned, the summit convened nationally recognized content experts in rural healthcare policy, health equity, value-based care, and clinical quality to really explore what rural hospitals and rural clinics could do. And the panelists really focused on actionable steps. So this report will assist you uh, as a hospital, as a clinic, or as a network leader on your path to value-based care and alternative payment models and really focus on advancing health equity in your rural communities. The Real Health Equity Toolkit that is on RHI Hub or Rural Health Information Hub um, it's a toolkit compiled of evidence-based frameworks and promising strategies and resources to support organizations working toward health equity like yours is across rural America. The modules in this toolkit contain information and resources focused on developing, implementing, then evaluating, and finally sustaining rural programs that focus on health equity. On the same website, there is also the Rural Health Literacy Toolkit. Uh, this toolkit, again, compiles evidence-based and promising um, practice models and resources that support your organization in implementing a health literacy uh, program or an initiative to really improve health literacy amongst those that you serve. And again, this toolkit has resources and information focused on developing, and then how do you implement it? How do you evaluate what you've implemented? And how do you sustain that literacy program? From the board leadership series, there is one that focuses on health equity. This video defines and describes health equity and how it can be addressed within rural communities. Boards and senior leaders will gain a better understanding of the unique strengths and challenges in rural communities in addressing health equity and the social influencers of health and discover ways that their hospitals can advance health equity. It does include some tools and resources and systems that might be employed and engaged. There's a collection of resources focusing on health equity on our website. This collection, it's updated quarterly and reflects resources created to increase the understanding of health equity. It assesses needs in communities and develops strategies to improve access and health outcomes for all. So it's a good place to go to find multiple resources. Healthy Idaho Places Index will be coming in February. Uh, as a companion piece to Get Healthy Idaho. So be looking for it when it does come out. Um, Stephanie will be sending it to you and we'll be reminding you uh, that it is there. So it can help you work with those social drivers of health in your communities. This is one of those major pieces that Kim mentioned. Um, a major piece of health equity really is the way you communicate. And this is a great resource for us as we begin to advance our health equity efforts to make sure that we have a narrative that is effective. The American Hospital Association has developed a tool for assessing health equity in your healthcare organizations. This link will bring you to that assessment and they've identified six levers in health equity and um, that's how this particular survey is uh, organized, but also this takes you to a link with a lot of learning behind each one of those specific drivers. 
social drivers play such a big impact um, in health equity and just a huge part in what we do. The publication on the left gives you some ideas on addressing various social drivers of health. On the right, you see the health equity toolkit, which provides a one place stop, shall we say, a one-stop shop in a sense for tools and resources and information that nurses as well as action coalitions and their partners can use to um, address uh, health equity by addressing those social drivers of health and tackling those. The IHI's white paper provides guidance on how healthcare organizations can reduce health disparities related to racial or ethnic groups, religion, uh, social economic status, gender, age, mental health, cognitive sensory or physical disabilities, sexual orientation or gender identity. Um, the graphic um, or, or geographic location, um, also other characteristics that both Rhonda and Kim have uh, mentioned that historically uh, cause discrimination and cause exclusion. Now those last three resources that I talked about really are a combination of education pieces, but they're also something that can help directly with your program. So now I'd like to identify a couple more tools that you can use right within your program. Our community population health team uses this health equity um, tool and it's adapted from the Minnesota Department of Health, Minnesota Department of Health Health Equity Tool developed by their Health Equity Task Force. Lots of healths in there to get this right. Um, uh, we'll be using this tool in our workshop, as Kim mentioned, uh, encouraging you to use uh, it to really check your team's work as you move along in your project. And so in our workshop next month, we'll be uh, revealing it or giving you a, a copy of it to start working with. And we need to know a baseline. Uh, we talk about measures. I mean, we need, and that's a base, we need to know that baseline. And so we need to know the baseline of our healthcare organizations around where we're at with health equity right now. And so doing an assessment is the easiest way to do this. And this is the assessment that we found very useful with the Minnesota Path to Value program. You will have a slide that has uh, links to some real live health equity project examples. They're your peers from other parts of the United States. Uh, Sparta, uh, they have a mobile clinic to address access issues because they have a very large migrant population. And Pickneyville talks about how they use care coordination as a way to address the many social drivers of health. And Henry County Medical Center took on the challenge of increasing access to mental health. And then there are other stories of hospitals just like yours that have taken on the challenge to do something around health equity. We hope that you have learned um, how to set the foundation of understanding um, the relationship between health equity and quality, how to apply a health equity lens when choosing an intended population. And I'm hoping that now you know some tools that will help you and your team move forward with any of your health equity initiatives. I'm going to ask Kiona to put up our post presentation poll for us. And as she does that, I would just like to open it up for any questions. We have five, 10 minutes here or comments. So please feel free to unmute yourself um, or else type something in the chat box. Also, I'm looking at the poll that um, Kiana just put up. So I just want to point out that there are three different questions. So you'll have to scroll down to hit all three.
Any questions? Feel free to unmute or um, stick something in the chat if you have a comment. Next steps here, um, I have had one-on-one -on -one calls with you. Uh, we've started talking about your intended population and you're kind of zeroing in on it. Nathan, I need to connect with you to talk about your intended population. Um, and if you're continuing with the same project or starting a new project here. Um, and um, after Thanksgiving, I want to take and narrow down those intended populations so you're ready for uh, our workshop coming up the second week of December. And as always, feel free to reach out to any of us. Are we done with the poll, Kiona? Okay, all right. With that, I wish everyone a very happy Thanksgiving and have a great rest of the week.